in the US, strong women are seen as cool. In Japan, we are taught to be obedient, said Mako Tanaka in 2021, a member of No Youth No Japan. It is a simple quote, but it also largely resonates with the widespread perception towards women that still exist in Japan. In a survey where people were asked of their stereotypical image of Japanese women, adjectives such as obedient, cute, and submissive were one of the largely common answers that many people gave. But again, we first have to ask why such stereotypes exist towards Japanese women in the first place. Historically, in the Edo period, the idea of a good wife was a quote-unquote obedient wife who would not argue against her husband and paid proper attention to domestic duties such as maintaining an orderly household as well as bearing children. Even though such blatant statements dividing the gender roles are no longer entirely tolerated even in Japan, many of the remnants of such social expectations of the old still remain in the Japanese society even to this day. If you read any article discussing the lack of gender equality in Japan, many of them state the myriad social expectations as well as the early social conditioning the Japanese women are subject upon from an extremely young age. Again, let us quote Mako Tanaka for example. To quote, at primary school, girls carry a red bag as opposed to the boys' black bag. Repeatedly, little by little, we are taught to be modest." End quote. This type of social conditioning based on gender from a young age is not exclusive to Japan, but its degree seems to be no doubt heightened in the case of Japan. Kumikumu Kaida, who is a professor at the Department of Psychology and Education at the Open University of Japan, conducted an interesting research where she surveyed Japanese female undergraduate students and asked them to describe the color that would best represent their personalities. Surprisingly, rather than confidently stating the color of their own choosing, 60% of the girls stated a color that were based on the choices of the other participants of the survey. They stated their reasons for doing this as it is quote-unquote easier to fit in, and that by choosing the color that everybody else chose, it does not quote-unquote stand out as much. Shockingly, only 3.8% of the female undergraduate survey participants actually said that they chose the color which they thought truly described their personality. Such results can actually seem, once again, shocking to the people in the US or any other country for that matter, as I'm more than confident that many of my female friends who are not Japanese you will have absolutely no hesitation in just choosing the color that they just thought to best describe the personalities. Again, I'm not stating on an absolute basis that a female undergraduate student from let's say a country such as Sweden will never demonstrate the type of behavior similar to the one shown by the 60% of the female Japanese participants of the survey. However, I am again confident that the amount of Swedish female undergraduate students who would just choose a color just because everybody else chose it in their best efforts to quote unquote not stand out as much will no doubt be much lower than the proportion of the Japanese female participants who would conduct such behavior. As topics related to gender can often be quite sensitive in its very nature, please note that no information or opinion in this video are in any way absolutely definitive. But with that said, it is safe to state that issues related to gender equality is not something that is only new to Japan, as struggles towards equality and a more equitable society in general is a progress in which most other nations around the world also strive towards. And if we are to observe from the wider perspective of world history, the type of struggle in which Ms. Tanaka of No Youth No Japan is currently engaged in right now can date back to as far as the 18th century when Mary Wollstonecraft wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Women. This work was created primarily in order to correct many of the statements which were made by the French diplomat Talleyrand on his statements against women. In Talleyrand's report to the French National Assembly in 1791, he wrote the following, to quote, The paternal home is better for the education of women. They have less need to learn to deal with the interests of others than to accustom themselves to a calm and secluded life. What Talleyrand has adamantly claimed with this particular statement, as well as the rest of his report, is that women basically are naturally, innately predisposed to be more suited towards attending affairs at home, and are not quote-unquote built physically and mentally for attending public affairs. 
He goes on to state that while there is indeed the existence of outliers who do not fit into this biological design and have more quote-unquote masculine predispositions, the vast majority of them are not such cases and has naturally fit better once again for attending domestic affairs and taking care of matters at home, while being largely passive and obedient to her husband. And while not to this extreme, such is a mindset still firmly held by many of the conservative, patriarchal segment of the Japanese population as well. As times have passed, and denying public education to women is rightfully not something that should even be considered as a matter of discussion at this point, the current problem for women in Japan is, more specifically, how life begins to turn out for them mainly after all of their formal education has been completed. According to the groundbreaking cross-cultural research conducted by the Dutch social psychologist Tofsted, in which I've mentioned in one of my previous videos, Japan actually ranks first in masculinity in the National Masculinity Femininity Scale. Not high up in the rankings or within the top 5 of the rankings, but literally the first place among all nations in which Hofstede studied. Hence, beyond the facade of the seemingly innocent and cute Hello Kitty dolls and the dessert-loving quote-unquote herbivore men, Japan is in reality still largely a patriarchal nation which in turn has its myriad repercussions for the female members of the society. For instance, while seemingly starting off with an equal foot with their male peers after recently graduating from university and newly entering into the workplace, a rigid glass ceiling invariably exists for the women in Japan as they climb up the corporate ladder. This obviously makes it exponentially difficult for most Japanese women to expect any form of legitimate career advancements. To put it into perspective, when Katsuyuki Kubo researched the number of female CEOs in Japan, only 0.8% out of the 42,000 observed firms had a female CEO at the time of the observation. In contrast, around 15% of all senior management in hedge funds across the world are led by females, according to research conducted by IG Prime. And when the particular article discussed the element of approximately 15% of women being in the corporate executive positions in the hedge fund industry, Phrases such as, quote-unquote, women still only represent, were prominently utilized, meaning that in the Western countries such as the United States or the United Kingdom, the 15% representation of female CEOs still seem tremendously low from a gender equality viewpoint. And quite justifiably so, as there are now more total number of female undergraduate students receiving university education in the United Kingdom compared to its male counterparts. However, when you compare those numbers to the sheer 0.8% of all executive managers in Japan being women, you begin to realize just how much of career advancement opportunities in which women actually have in Japan. Furthermore, while there are some brave women in Japan, such as the case of Ms. Tanaka, who are raising their voices on the need for more gender equality in Japan and the need to fix the excessive societal pressure towards women to be quote-unquote feminine, you will ironically never see nowhere near as much women in Japan who are fighting for gender equality as conducted by the women in the United States or in the United Kingdom. So if one asks if the women in Japan are more quote-unquote passive and obedient in comparison to women from other countries, the answer may superficially seem to be a yes, based on information such as the results from the Color Choice Survey or Hofstede's cultural research which demonstrated the quote-unquote masculine nature of the Japanese society. However, if asked on whether being submissive and obedient is a genuine element of their personality, the question may take on a whole new dimension. This is as although Japanese women may exhibit submissive behavior on the facade, as seen from various research, they may be deliberately acting in this fashion even if it is against their natural will, in order to quite simply maximize their chances of survival in the male-dominant Japanese society. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, human needs for elements such as esteem, while still important and a definitive part of the overall human need, are subordinate to the more fundamental physiological needs such as the need for sleep and adequate nutritional intake. Hence, for many of the women in Japan, the act of being passive is not merely an option, but a necessity for the very survival in this particular society in which they were placed upon from birth. 
To elaborate, the vast majority of Japanese women are smart individuals and are perfectly aware of their standing and the culturally entailed expectations towards them. So in a sense, they are acting in accordance to the very first assumption in which you are told to make in any classic microeconomics textbook, in that human beings are rational beings and act in accordance to each individual's subjective framework or rationality. For some of the viewers who may not have studied economics as an academic subject prior to watching this video, which is perfectly understandable by the way, as the subject is far from being the most interesting academic discipline, this assumption does not mean that all individuals make the right decision every single time by conducting the decision that they think to be the most rational. However, what this assumption of rationality does mean is that individuals think and act rationally based on their subjective beliefs and principles which are uniquely formed over the span of their lifetime. Thus, if one acts in a manner which conforms to their subjective framework or rationality, which in turn will bring the highest possible well-being for themselves given available information about opportunities and other constraints, they are said to be rational beings in this sense. So from this perspective, the majority of women in Japan, such as the participants of the college choice research, are acting in a perfectly rational manner, aiming to maximize their chances of being able to satisfy the most fundamental needs of human existence, mostly in the order of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, through rational actions. For example, by understanding the fact that there is going to be a definite glass ceiling above them in terms of being able to advance in their respective careers, Many of them eventually come to the rational conclusion that it would be more reasonable to morph themselves into beings that would be most desirable when it comes to attracting the most competent partner for marriage. And as Japan is indeed chiefly a masculine society, with many of the financially competent men with prestigious occupations oozing with the element of machismo, display of personal tendencies by the women that would signal to the male prospect that one is naturally a quote unquote feminine, vulnerable, shy, passive, submissive, obedient, whatever you want to call it, this type of being will often act as a huge advantage for the women in the world of Japanese marriage. But all of this seems to be unfair, to say the least, and even archaic to some degree, as it does not seem to be the type of socially dominant mindset that should prevalently exist in the more westernized, highly developed nations such as Japan. Hence, such an atmosphere is something that is hard to perceive by the average non-Japanese individual and one has to truly place oneself amongst the Japanese people, such as in the middle of the workplace, in order to truly observe its predominance. And when Japanese authority figures do have a rare chance to reveal themselves briefly to the international audience, they often unconsciously let out their patriarchal mindset and are subsequently chastised by the international community. However, similar or significantly worse attitude against women at the workplace, which is common daily occurrence in Japan, will seldom receive any public light as long as the action remains strictly within Japanese domains. If I could give you guys an example of such type of situation, this is exactly what happened when the president of the Olympics organizing committee, Yoshihiro Mori, jokingly said that, quote unquote, women talk too much in meetings only a few months prior to the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics. Although he was forced to resign from his position primarily as a consequence of the international backlash, you can make a safe bet that if such a statement was conducted strictly within Japanese domains, no one would have betted an eye against the conduct, as similar or again considerably worse statements are made across the Japanese society on a ubiquitous basis throughout the nation. If some women bravely complain about such acts, it is often the offended women who is deemed as quote-unquote eccentric and is subsequently ostracized by the majority with stigmas such as being a person who quote-unquote cannot take a joke or are quote-unquote easily triggered. And when many women do choose to raise their voice in the need for change on an anonymous basis through the internet, it is once again largely ignored as a mere phenomenon of antisocial women with quote-unquote masculine personalities or easily triggered personalities just being grouchy as usual as a consequence of not being able to largely fit in and behave harmoniously within the society. So when it comes to the question of whether the women in Japan are more quote-unquote submissive-minded and quote-unquote obedient, the answer is truly mixed. Yes, in the sense that at least as far as the veneer, the vast majority of women in Japan will indeed seem to be overall more shy and passive compared to their Western counterparts. 
However, when asked if such tendencies are their true innate personal predispositions, the answer may come out rather differently. And even if some of the women in Japan do genuinely regard themselves as more submissive and shy as a part of their very inborn nature, you could even question the validity of such claims as much of the women in Japan are socially conditioned from a very young age with the quote-unquote feminine values and how to act appropriately in society as a woman. So if such values and codes of behavior are so deeply conditioned to them throughout the entire period of physical as well as psychological development, can you really claim as some do that quote-unquote women in Japan are just born to be more feminine than the manly females out there in most other modern nations nowadays? I believe you guys can come to your own logical conclusions on this one.